Um, but before we get into uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 3 to 6, uh, let us pray. Lord, help us to uh, know your standards. Help us to know uh, what you desire of each one of us, how to imitate you, how to walk with you, how to walk in love, but also to, to see the, uh, the warning signs and the dangers that are ahead, uh, the temptations that are there, and the weakness of the human body to give in to those temptations. I pray that um, as we go through this uh, passage, as, uh, as Paul wrote to the people of Ephesus, uh, warning them and telling them about um, the sexual uh, impurities and idolatry, covetousness, filthiness, greed, and all that. Help us to uh, really take it to heart and that we see uh, some warning signs and that we'll be able to deviate and steer, steer away from that. So, Father, uh, we thank you for the time that we have and continue to uh, just guide us in your sons. I pray. Amen. The passage for this morning is chapter uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 6. And it says this, and this is after Paul writes about imitating God and, and walking in love. And it says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. To be good, I think it's difficult. To be bad is, is very easy. It's easy to be bad. It's easy to cause trouble. It's easy to, to fall into that being bad, those temptations. It's easy to give in to the peer pressures. It's easy to fall into that pit. But it's so difficult to be, to be good. I would think that there's 60-something people in here. How many of us would consider ourselves to be good? How many of you guys are good? Nobody? No one's good. Hmm? Good enough. Because it's difficult to be good. It's difficult to choose what is right. And to choose what is right is hard. And as we've heard last week, it's, it was about imitating God and to walk in love. And those are the first two verses. And then he says, but... And that's very difficult to do, especially in this world that we're living in, in this culture that, that we live. There are temptations, there are influences, there is, we have business, we're, there's preoccupation, distraction, and in many more that steer us away from walking in the footsteps of Jesus. So Paul is encouraging them to walk in love, to imitate God, he says, but, and there are all these things that, he says that we're not supposed to have or to do. And Paul in this passage touches upon after encouraging us to imitate God by walking in love, by calling all believers to holiness, to be set apart, to be difficult, to do what is hard. We are gathered here this morning to worship God, this morning. Hopefully we woke up and we're excited to come to church and we're like, yes, I want to be at church and we're excited. And we're excited to listen to, to, to God's word, the spoken word of God, the real living word of God. And it's important to know we need God's word if we will understand who he is and who we, who we are and what he expects of us. It's hard to, in order to live our lives without God's word, without directing us. Because without God's word, without knowing him, our, we, our life is directionless. God, in calling us to imitate him in the first two verses, now calls us in the next four to live a life of holiness, to be set apart from the world. To live a hot life of holiness, God commands believers 
to be sexually pure. Difficult to do in this world. And this comes in verses 3 to 4. Believers are to be morally pure. pure. It says, but sexuality and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. See, we live at a time when even professing Christians, believers, deny that God's moral standards are absolutely true. See, absolute truth is something that is true at all times and in all places. It is something that is always true no matter what the circumstances God's absolute truth. Knowing that only 23% of born-again or evangelical Christians express a strong belief in absolute truth. 23%, pretty much one out of four, believe in God's absolute truth. According to Washington Times in our culture, 47% approve of homosexuality with 83% liberals and 23% conservatives. And among the liberals, 89% approve of sex between an unmarried man and woman, and 33% conservatives agree. Because it's hard to believe in God's absolute truth. It's hard to agree and to be doing what is difficult to do. Difficult, hard to do. See, God's standard for moral purity is absolute and is not up for a popular vote. We're not voting what is right and what is wrong because what we know what is right is God's truth. It is God's standards and not our own standards. We don't have our own standards compared to God's standards because God's standards are always true. It's not about our own opinions or our own circumstance or how we were brought up that determines the truth. The scriptures, the word of God, determines the truth. God is the designer of sexual relationship for a man and a woman and a lifelong committed marriage. And when it is practiced within these boundaries, it is a good gift. It is a gift from God and not something dirty. See, sex is not a dirty word. Sex, when it is practiced how God intended, is a gift from God. And everything else is not a gift from God. Everything else is dirty, is filthy. When it is outside of those boundaries of marriage between man and woman, then it becomes dirty, immoral, impure. Impure. Paul does not list specific sins, but Paul does list specific sins, but writes any behavior or desire not in keeping with God's original design for our sexuality. He writes in, or Mark writes in Mark chapter 7, seven verses 21 through 22, 23, it says, From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, Murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. And all these evil things come from within and they, de they defile a person. It doesn't come from the outside. We're not covered by it. It comes from within the person. It's our choice. We make those choices. Jesus said immoral behavior comes out of the heart and we must deal with it on the heart level. Paul lists out six terms believers are not to practice. One, immorality. This is the Greek word porneia. Porn. Which refers to any type of sexual immorality. It includes premarital sex, extramarital sex, incest, homosexuality, and the use of pornography. Outside of how God intended, sex is sin. Outside of the marriage between man and woman. Second is impurity. This word literally means dirty. 
and was used to refer to the pus around the infected wound. If you've ever been injured, and there's blood, and there's redness, and there's around, there's pus. That's what it means. The pus around the infected area. Here he refers to that which contaminates others and is repulsive and disgusting. Paul writes in Ephesians 4.19, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Practicing every kind of impurity, the dirtiness, the filthiness. Third word is covetousness. Covetousness simply means greed. The greedy man has a lust for more. It never satisfies. They want more and more and more, and they can't ever satisfy the person. Whether it is material possession, money, or other things, to covet, to be greedy, is motivated by self. Because it is what I want. It is what I need. It is what I desire. It is something that I covet. It's not what God covets for me. It is what I covet for myself. Instead of wanting what God wants, it's what I want. Paul puts it bluntly. These three things, immorality, impurity, and covetousness, these sins should not be non-existent among believers. We should not be feeding our minds with these sins by watching movies, TVs, being on social media that depict them. When you watch TV, there's so much junk on TV. When you go on social media, there's so much junk on that social media. It's incredible growing up nowadays. You could be five, six, seven years old. You have an iPad or a phone, and you could search anything that you want. And as a parent, you have no idea what they're searching for or looking at. So much junk out there. Even the TV shows that we watch. Growing up in the 70s, or not 70s, 80s and 90s, TV shows were kind of innocent. It was. The worst, I think, TV show that I have ever watched growing up was Three's Company. You know Three, Three's Company? It was... Two women and a guy, a guy who acted like he was gay, but he was straight, living together. I think, to me, that was like the worst. But nowadays, you have real housewives or whatever. Real housewives of these, these places. Who watches that show? Be honest. Anybody here? No? Anybody here? I know so many who watch it, right? So much junk on TV. We should definitely not be viewing anything like that or even searching on the website for any pornography, right? Because it says, the scripture says, sexual impurity can't be. Do not covet. Don't have immorality. Romans 16, 19 says, I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. To be wise to be in what is good and to be innocent as to what is evil. Whatever is bad, be innocent to it. Filthiness, the fourth one. This refers to any indecency, obscenity, shameful thing, or disgraceful. Fifth one in this context, foolish talk. This comes from two words that mean foolish speech. We get our word moron. Did you know that? We get our word moron from the root word fool. In the scriptures, the fool has a different meaning that we are accustomed to. It is not someone who is mentally deficient, deficient, but rather someone who is morally deficient because he constantly ignores God's word. That's a fool. Someone who continues to ignore, the, ignore God's word continuously. This is a person who makes light of God's word and God's commandments. As if it's not really the truth. 
And sometimes we throw out scriptures or what God says and say, this is what God means. When it really doesn't mean what God means. Foolish talk. Moron. Number six, crude joking. This has the idea of someone who can make a quick comeback using clever words. It's turning something into a dirty joke similar to what many stand-up comedians do. Crude joking. Are we even guilty of that? To be morally pure, we've got to commit ourselves to God's standards, to God's absolute truth. To know that we have God's standards and we have to live up to God's standards. It can't be what our friends' standards are or our culture standards are. Because they deviated from God's truth many, many years ago. Because one of the classes that I took in Bible college is that the world in church history, the church is here. And the world was once close to it. But further and further away, the world has gone to God. Shamefully, regretfully, embarrassingly, the world, the church has followed the ways of the world and have, fallen, have gone further and further away from God. Kind of sad when we think about it. Because God has never changed. God is there. A lot of times we ask ourselves, wow, you know what? How come God doesn't seem to be part of my life? How come God isn't there for me? See, God has never really changed. God has never gone anywhere. But it is us who have gone away from God. It's almost like we've been on a boat. And sometimes unknowingly, we have gone offshore. We wake up, and we're like, where are we? Where am I? Where is that island? What happened to the island? And that's what's happened. Secondly, to live a life of holiness, believers are to give thanks. In verse, at the end of verse 4, it says, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. Believers are to give thanks. Kind of strange, after saying what Paul had to say in verse 3, and the beginning of verse 4, he says, let there be thanksgiving. Out of all these things, these six things that he's put up, he says, let there be thanksgiving. So what does thanksgiving or thankfulness have to do with moral purity? Why does he say that? What does thanks, thankfulness have to do with moral purity? What Paul is essentially saying is to put off immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk, and crude joking by putting on a grateful heart with thanksgiving. See, these six terms on a heart of thanksgiving cannot exist at the same time. We can't have immorality, impurity, covetousness, foolishness, foolish talk, filthiness, crude joking, and be thankful at the same time. We can't be mad and be happy at the same time. We can't. We can't be mad one second, and the next second we're smiling. Something's wrong with you then, right? Similarly, he lists these six things out, and he says you can't have these six things in your life and be thankful. That's hard. It can't exist together at the same time. We cannot imitate God and walk in love and be morally impure. Heath Lambert in his book, Finally Free Rights, greed covers more than just a powerful desire for money. Greed has to do with covetousness, sinful desires, and evil lust. Not only should we avoid sexual immoral behaviors, we should avoid having a heart that is greedy for them. Greedy lust undercuts gladness, while gratitude produces it. Gratitude fuels gladness and multiplies it. It is the logic of gratitude to, to be thankful for what you have instead of longing for what you don't. 
to be thankful for what I have and not for what I don't have and to be grumbling about it. Paul is saying focus on giving thanks to God. When there are things, when temptations, when we have a choice to be bad or good, focus on giving thanks to God. Focus on God. And when we focus more on giving thanks to God, the more we will see joy and gladness in our hearts and our lives, and it will become easier to steer away from impurity once we focus on God. One of my leaders told me way back then, when there are temptations, when you fall into sin, and it has you entangled in its web, search your heart for patterns of ingratitude, and desires that are contrary to the Lord. And when you have done all that thinking and all those thoughts, he says, repent of those. Come to the Lord and repent. He's asking us, or he told me, to do a personal biology of my own heart then ask God to change your heart to become one filled with thanksgiving, giving thanks to God and to repent. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I memorized it in NIV. So I'll read it in NIV. And it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, as let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. In verse 2, he continues, as fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And after these first two verses, the writer of Hebrews is as consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It says we have witnesses who we have gone before us, that we have witnesses that have finished this race. They've been tempted, they've been tried, and they finished this race. We have all these witnesses. They have gone before us. And there are people who are continuing even to go through this race with us, accountable with us. And it says we have witnesses who have finished this race. People that are cheering us on. If you ever ran track and field, and running around that 400-meter oval stadium track. There are people shouting and screaming, yelling to run, to run, to finish, to finish, to keep at it, to persevere. You hear it, and you get motivated. And even though you want to quit, you see it and say, you know what, I need to keep going, I need to keep going. You run around and run around, and then you see the finish line. You keep going and keep going because there are people who have already finished this race, who have gone through what we're, we're going through, and they're encouraging us. We have witnesses. He says, you know what, when you struggle, he says to throw off everything that hinders. And what hinders us? What hinders me? What hinders you? Does TV, does computer, does phones, do friends, do your pride, the culture, does that hinder us? Matthew 29, 9, 5, 29 through 30 says this in the those both most incredible sermon that has ever been spoken to. And the Sermon of the Mount it says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. 
crazy, huh? If your eyes causes you to sin, pluck it out. Then you won't be able to see her. It doesn't mean literally, right? If your hand causes to steal, cut it off. Then you won't ever be tempted to steal, right? And that's what it means to be focused on who Jesus is and what he did and consider him who endured such things from sinners. Jesus came to us in order that we could relate to him. Jesus set that example. Remember last Sunday, I shared with you from the very beginning, a person came to the pastor and said, how are we supposed to be as parents? By example, by example, by example. And Jesus Christ came into this world and he led by example and he lived a perfect life so that we could relate to him as man and woman to see our Jesus, our Savior, was perfect, who led by example. Jesus, his pure focus was on his Father, to do his Father's will. He endured all kinds of ridicule, scorn from sinners, enduring, not growing weary, and not losing heart. Lastly, to live a life of holiness, believers are not to be deceived. Or believers are warned not to be deceived. In verses 5 through 6, it says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of obedience. Paul here shows us the severity and the seriousness of these sins, immorality, impurity, idolater. His words to the church of Ephesus are very sharp to the point, but it is very truthful. For Paul, there is no messing around. What Paul is saying is that while believers may fall into these sins, no genuine Christians can continue to, to live in these sins. We may fall in it. And that's when we have to go into our hearts and we have to diagnose it. And when we've prayed about it, we repent. It says no genuine Christians can continue to live in such thin sins. And 1 John 7, 3, 7 to 3, Seven and eight, it says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. See, Paul knew that many, including many Christian leaders, would say, You're under grace. God is a God of love who won't condemn you. Once you're saved, you're saved. You can live however you want. God understands your weaknesses. By these words, people are deceived and lure them into this eternal damnation. Once we're saved, we're saved. But yet we can live our lives however we want. It can't be that way. Once we're saved, we are saved, but we have to imitate God. We have to live in the example of the example that Jesus Christ showed us. See, the words of sons of disobedience refers to those whose lives are characterized by disobedience, not to those who have fallen but repented. First John 3, 19, 9 through 10, it says, No one born of God makes a perfect makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. If anyone or someone who professes to be a believer, but he continues to live habitually in disobedience to God's moral standards, it is evidence, maybe, probably, most likely, that he has not been born again. Unless he has truly repented, 
Paul says he has no inheritance in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Christ. He also faces God's eternal wrath, eternal damnation, separation from God. I conclude with Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. For you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and, these th and things like these. And it continues on, and as I warn you, as I warned you before, that, th that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and his desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Amen.